Good morning. I'm Wauwatosa Police Sergeant Abby Pavlik, P-A-V-L-I-K. I'm the department's public information officer. I would like to thank you all for attending this morning. This press conference is via held via Zoom due to COVID-19 concerns. Before we begin, I'm going to lay out the ground rules for the conference. Mayor McBride will give a brief statement before we open the floor to questions for both the mayor and police chief Barry Weber. We have allotted an hour and a half for the press conference and we'll do our best to make sure everyone's questions are answered. All media will be muted until it is your turn to ask a question. We ask that you raise your hand and the moderator will call on you in the order of hands raised. There will be no immediate follow-up questions. However, if you have another question, please raise your hand and we will circle back to you. We will let you know when we are nearing the end of our time and only a few more questions will be taken. We will now get things started. The video will cut for a moment while we get the mayor and chief on camera. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mayor Dennis McBride. Civil unrest has occurred in communities across the United States this year. In Wauwatosa, fortunately, we did not have any loss of life. We did not lose any buildings as has occurred in other cities. Our community has strong and differing opinions about the past few days. We have heard those opinions and will continue to hear them. We acknowledge them and we want you to know that our primary goal was safety. Fortunately, fortunately, we had no serious injuries. Moving forward, Wauwatosa is focused on equity work, and we will continue to do so over the coming months. The Common Council has authorized the purchase of body-worn cameras for the Wauwatosa Police Department. City staff is taking impl implicit bias training. The Police Department is participating in enhanced crisis intervention training and de-escalation training. And I am working with every one of our city departments to review our operations through an equity lens. We are here today to be totally transparent and to answer your questions about the events over the past several days in Wauwatosa. I have taken media interviews every day, several times a day, and our police chief, Barry Weber, has been focused on the safety of our community during that time. But we are here today together to answer your questions. And now we welcome hearing from you. Our first question will be from Ben Jordan. Um, ben, you will need to unmute. All righty, can, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. All right, first question here for you. Um, why did the city of Wauwatosa choose to use so much force from the start of this? Didn't the display of military grade gear and tactics almost ensure that there would be problems over the past several days? I'd like to address that if I may. Uh, we've been preparing for this time for several months. Uh, we, uh, learn from events in other cities, particularly in Kenosha. Our planning took account of that. Uh, we would, our primary goal was, is, and always has been to make sure that no one got hurt. And fortunately, with the cooperation of the community and with the good work of the police department, we accomplished that. Our next question will be from Hillary. Okay. Um, Chief Weber, um, why was the family of Alvin Cole arrested? Were they breaking the law prior to the arrest? Were they TOSA officers that made the arrest? And is there body camera footage of those arrests? The, the reason that the Cole family was arrested is they were involved with a group of uh, people that were, were told to, um, to leave the area, they were violating the curfew order. 
we give several warnings. They were they did not comply with those uh, warnings, so they were arrested with other people also. Um, I don't have any body camera footage of that particular incident. Um, there were officers from Wauwatosa, I believe, were involved in some others uh, from other jurisdictions that were also assisting us. I think it's important to note that no one targeted the Cole family. Uh, the officers weren't aware that they were the Cole family. They were just people who were violating the curfew at that time. Our next question will be from Evan Casey. Hi there. Um, I was at the, the protest event both Friday and Saturday night, and clearly there was a, a very different approach by law enforcement on Saturday night. It was very peaceful. Um, obviously, no tear gas was used. I was wondering if there was a reason for this. Um, it seemed as well on Friday night that protesters did start to move back when law enforcement came forward and that they obviously, that tear gas was used that night. Um, I was wondering if there's anybody in charge of, um, or different in charge on Friday night compared to Saturday night, or if it was the same kind of approach, I guess. We, we had the same uh, people in charge. Uh, we respond to how the crowd reacts and if people, uh, uh, they were more law abiding and followed the directions of the police officers uh, after a curfew and uh, left peaceably. Once that happened, um, there, there was no need for us to do anything further. Our next question will be from Fox 6. <clears throat> Hi, good morning. Um, I, I just want to know what the impact of last week's decision um, has on Officer Mensa's employment status. I know Mayor McBride, you'd previously said you wanted him to transition his employment out of the force. Um, and, and if he does remain on the force, are there going to be special provisions made for him when he returns to the field? I think I can answer the first part of that question, then the chief should answer the second part. But the first part of that is, Officer Mensa's uh, employment remains the same, his status remains the same because the Police and Fire Commission has a complaint uh, that it is considering. So it is not in the hands of the Police Department, the Mayor's Office, or the Common Council at this time. I, I think that anything that I would say, would we, we would just be speculating as to what might happen with what the decisions ultimately are. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see what, what that turns out to be. But right now, as the mayor said, his status is the same. Our next question will be from Evan Casey. Oh, I hate to read. Okay. And I also heard that some people who were arrested and taken into custody were taken to several different area police departments, um, Waukesha County, West Dallas, um, and that they were also questioned as well for several hours. Um, is there a reason for this, why this happened? Sure. Um, due to the number of people that were taken into custody, we don't have a, enough room to, to put everybody in one space and to expedite it, to get them out uh, more quickly. So when you say they were in there for several hours, that might just been to go through the booking process, but they were uh, released as quickly as possible. We currently do not have any media with hands raised. Okay, here we go. Next question is from Tony. Hi there. I'm wondering if you could go into a little more detail about what role the National Guard played while they were uh, part of this operation here. I think the National Guard is here to uh, supplement uh, any law enforcement needs that we had. Uh, they do not operate independently, but operate with the police department. And any time that they were involved with anything, they would be accompanied by police officers. So it was more to uh, support what our efforts were. Our next question will be from Suzanne Spencer. Hi, this message uh, question is for Chief Weber in particular. Do you support Joseph Mensa remaining on the force? It's kind of an interesting question to ask. Um, um, as we've said, there is a process that is in place, but you know, uh, Joseph Mensa has been cleared by the district attorney in three different cases. There's been no reason up to this point and none that I can see that he should be removed from the force. He has acted legally and lawfully in uh, all previous actions that I'm aware of. 
Our next question will be from Hillary. So what are the plans for the curfew moving forward? Are we done with it? And if so, what will the city, what will the police presence look like tonight? The curfew ended at 6 a.m. this morning. So there is no longer any curfew in effect. So as far as we're concerned, it's business as usual. And uh, hopefully people will, will remain calm and peaceful like they have the last few nights and uh, we get back to, to living our lives as citizens. The next question will be from Taran Powell. Taran. Taran Powell. Hi, yes, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, um, this question is also uh, just regarding how um, some protesters are saying they were treated this weekend. Um, some saying they were, um, and I'm seeing this social media, some saying they were arrested before the curfew um, held for, you know, a couple hours in unmarked vehicles and then, you know, taken to parts of Milwaukee. They were just dropped off and weren't told where to go or didn't know where they were. I mean, what do you have to, to say to that? Chief. Yeah, that, that information is false. Uh, nobody was arrested uh, uh, prior to the curfew unless they were committing some other violation, but we didn't make arrests prior to curfew and nobody was dropped off in, un, in undisclosed locations. Oftentimes when somebody was, is released, if they don't have a, a, a transportation, they'll ask us uh, to take them someplace and usually as a courtesy, we convey them to a, a place of their choosing, but we don't just drop somebody indiscriminately and, and leave them there. That does not happen. Our next question is from Ben Jordan. Unmuting there quick. Uh, I was out there on Friday night and it got chaotic there outside of City Hall for um, several moments. Do you believe the pellets and tear gas and the amount that were deployed was an adequate response to the plastic bottles we saw thrown toward the police line? You know, I think if, if somebody's going to throw things at uh, police officers, we're going to respond appropriately. And I think that was done. And as we said at the outset, there is a minimum of anybody hurt. Uh, we didn't have any officers hurt seriously. We didn't have any protesters that were hurt seriously. So uh, the fact remains that if somebody's going to throw rocks and bottles at police officers, which did happen, we're going to respond with uh, with force to, to make sure that doesn't continue. The next question is from Evan Casey. And I was wondering how many total arrests were made um, in the last five nights, and then also were all the arrests made? All of them were they made because of the curfew violation, or were there other reasons um, regarding that? There were, I think, about 64, 65 arrests total. We're still, I'll still get those final numbers, uh, getting them together. The majority of them were for curfew, but there were some other violations in there as well. Well, they included felonies. There were people, uh, one man was arrested with Molotov cocktails in his backpack, for example. So uh, those are pretty serious offenses. UWM, you have the floor. Hi, just another uh, follow-up to my previous question about protesters. Um, is there any truth to folks not being returned their cell phones after being released from um, being detained? Not sure at this point. Uh, anything that we would, uh, if we have anything it's, uh, that we've kept, it's uh, for evidentiary purposes. And once that is, uh, we're done with that, then they would probably be released because there's no, there would be no further reason to keep them. But I can't tell you for sure if everybody's got their property back yet. Our next question will be from Fox 6. Yeah, are there regrets on behalf of the city or police department for not equipping all officers with body cameras sooner? I, I would say this, uh, we've always been in favor of having body cameras, but you know, it, uh, it's, it's pretty cost uh, uh, prohibitive for a lot of cities. There's many cities that are not considering body cameras because of that cost. Our city just voted a week ago to spend uh, $742,000, I believe it was, to, to equip us with the body cameras. 
You know, unfortunately, um, people think that body cameras is, are the answer to everything, and they're not. Sometimes they generate more questions than, than, uh, than if there weren't any cameras. In some of these particular cases, we wish we had the, uh, the cameras, but uh, I think we were able to get the, to the bottom of the information that, that we needed. And uh, I'm mistaken, I think the, uh, I said 742, I think it was $762,000, 762, yep. Our next question will be from Tim. Sorry about that. Uh, Chief Weber, I believe you said that you just saw no reason that Officer Mensa wouldn't be allowed to come back since he's been cleared. However, the independent investigator hired by the Police and Fire Commission uh, in Wauwatosa said that uh, the, there's a high likelihood of a fourth shooting should he come back. I'd like your reaction to that. And have you read that independent investigator report? Uh, and what was your reac reaction after reading it? Sure. Um, first off, yes, I have, I have read the report. I've never heard of any police officer ever being disciplined because of something they may or may not do in the future. You know, to say that there's, uh, speculate that it, it's, it's likely that it'll happen in the future, well, that's, that's not factual. So that doesn't meet the standards of the, the statute of just cause, 6213. And also the fact that uh, some of the complaints that were alleged in the, that complaint against uh, Mensa were dismissed outright by the independent investigator. So what the recommendation is, is to discipline him based on the fact that he might do something in the future and then he went on a radio program and said some things. Does that rise to the level of a termination? Not with me. If anything, I'd probably reprimand the guy or just say, don't do that again. But to the, for the things that I've seen so far, and that's just my personal opinion because I have no idea what the Police and Fire Commission is going to say, nor do I know if they've even seen the report, but that's what my initial reaction is. Our next question will be from Douglas Glass. Hey, I'm sorry. Uh, this is uh, Doug Glass. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, Tim just asked my question, which was going to be to ask the chief to elaborate on the, uh, the Mensa decision, but I'll, I'll ask a different question. Uh, there was this allegation by a couple of daily caller journalists that they were beaten while recording the coal arrests. Chief, can you speak to that? Yes. Yes, I did uh, see some video from that. And, uh, you know, I, I don't believe that's a true allegation at all. And the one person who claims that he was, uh, he, he was arrested and roughed up, if that's his allegation, he was resisting arrest and the officers used a minimal amount of force to just get him under control. So to say that he was uh, beaten and uh, roughed up, that, that's just not true. We got video on that. And if I, I'd like to add that um, there's been some allegations that um, members of the media were targeted, which is not true. When, we, when I issued my emergency declaration, we said that uh, members of the media with credentials would be allowed to remain on the streets and would not be deemed to have committed a curfew violation. Uh, there have been several people who have claimed to be members of the media. They did not have credentials and therefore they were not exempt from curfew violations. Our next question will be from Ben Jordan. What is the plan for responding to uh, protests without a curfew? Will there be the same use of tear gas and pellets if crowds are deemed to be gathering in an unlawful way on the streets? Is the National Guard currently on standby to respond if the crowds grow to a, a similar size as we saw perhaps on Friday night? First off, there is no curfew in effect so if people are behaving lawfully, unless they want to disrupt or vandalize or whatever, we would not be responding in, in any method or any way that we would need to use force. So, but again, if, if people are gathering unlawfully and they choose to be disruptive or, or cause us problems, then we will respond in kind. But I'm optimistic that that won't happen. Our next question will be from Evan Casey.
Hi there. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes. Um, I was wondering why the emergency declaration by the city was made on September 30th, um, about a week before the DA, the DA decision, um, you know, enacting the curfew, if that was to happen. I was wondering why that was, why that decision was made by the city, I guess. Yes, thank you for that question. It's been asked by many people, and there's a very simple answer, which is, uh, I asked the same question before I signed it, and I was told that we could not get um, the assistance of the National Guard and put other uh, preventive measures in place without uh, a statement of emergency like that. So it was a necessary legal step. Um, we were hoping that uh, the order would not have to go into effect. We also didn't know precisely when the district attorney was going to make his announcement. Uh, there have been some complaints uh, that uh, we should have told the Common Council the night before. We, the night before, we still did not know whether and when the district attorney would make his announcement. So we had the emergency declaration in place so that we could put our preventive measures in place to protect the safety of everyone in our community. I think it should also be known too that uh, that request came from me to the mayor because sometimes I know the mayor gets uh, heat from people that say, well, why would you do this? Why would you make this emergency declaration? That's a law enforcement request. And as he said, to get more resources that we need, but that, that comes from us and the mayor uh, responded very uh, supportive way. So I think that that did a, a lot to uh, alleviate some problems that we were gonna have. And I also uh, um, talked several times with the school superintendent to make sure that uh, the school district was aware of our plans and uh, I wanted to give the school district time to put any measures in place that it could and all that. So there was a lot of planning involved. This is not something you do uh, six hours before or the day before. Uh, there are a lot of moving pieces here. The next question is from Hillary. If the um, Cole family has filed a lawsuit, they've been looking to get open records since June, paying over $1,000. Why is it taking so long? I think one of the reasons is because their attorney has filed like so many open records requests, uh, like over 40 of them. It just takes a long time to, to uh, accumulate uh, that information. She's asked for information from decades of records, things that happened even before I was police chief here in Wauwatosa, which is over 30 years. So it takes a long, long time to do that. What they're actually striving for, it's not clear to me, but we've done, every, uh, we've done everything we can to accommodate the request. My understanding is a lot of these are paper records too. They're not in electric, you know, electronic right. form so that they're not easily retrievable. It, I, I'm sure we can all appreciate how much harder it is to go back and search through file cabinet after file cabinet. Uh, we've actually had to hire extra help to try to uh, respond to this. It's a monumental, monumental effort right now. And um, if it had been a narrow request, those records would have been provided long ago. Our next question will be from Suzanne. Hi, this is Suzanne. Uh, this question is for Chief Weber. In a previous public appearance at the FBI a few months ago, you had said training isn't always the answer for members of the police force. The mayor had mentioned specific training at the start of this call. Do you think that what the officers will be going through is enough to ensure that the public feels safe? I absolutely do. And when I, I remember that conversation that we had, and, and the context was is that whenever something happens, uh, and, and this was in response to like the George, George Floyd incident in Minnesota, a lot of times uh, members of the public think that it's because police officers don't have enough training. Police officers, as I said, have, they have a lot of training. And um, the fact is that like we saw up in Minnesota is a police officer chose to act in an illegal manner. And that's, you know, you can have as much training in the world that doesn't uh, detract somebody from acting that way. But some of the training we've, we've tried to refocus on is the implicit bias training People want us to have the de-escalation training, which we, we've always had in our curriculum already, and pro professional communications training, we've done that, but we're just trying to see if we can enhance that even more to give people more of a level of comfort. But uh, people should realize that this is something that has always been in our curriculum. And prior to George Floyd, for example, we have just not had allegations against our police department. The next question will be from Ben Jordan. Uh, 
Uh, Mayor McBride, do you think Officer Mensa is fit for duty? Just a couple months ago, you and the Common Council said you wanted him to no longer serve in Wauwatosa because of lost community trust. Now, we just heard from uh, Chief Weber um, on his thoughts about this. What are your thoughts? Do you believe he is fit for duty um, in the city of Wauwatosa? I'm not a police officer. I'm not a psychologist. I'm a mayor. I'm a lawyer. Uh, those uh, things don't qualify me to judge fitness of police officers. I do stand by what I said a few months ago, but at this point, we have to be very clear as a community that there's a legal process underway. And I am not going to put my thumb on the scale. I'm not gonna put additional pressure on the police and fire commissioners. They are citizen volunteers who work for free, who have day jobs. We have a long process ahead of us. I understand that the community is impatient for a result. We all are. We, I'm sure Officer Mensa would like to have his status resolved as well. But he is entitled to due process under the state and federal constitutions. And uh, we have legal briefs that need to be filed, testimony taken, deliberation by the Police and Fire Commission, and a decision written. All that's going to take time. I am not going to add to the pressure on the Police and Fire Commission by uh, stating my opinion at this point. They need to be left alone to do the job they're doing. They're wonderful people who are uh, taking their responsibilities seriously. The next question will be from Evan Casey. <clears throat> Yes, do you know how many area law enforcement departments were called in to help out um, these last five nights? Yeah, I haven't uh, made a, a tally of all of them, but there's been a lot of uh, support around the state for, for law enforcement. That's one thing that uh, the um, uh, law enforcement is very fortunate is that we have many partners and we all work together. And police officers, even in small jurisdictions, have the similar training as uh, in larger jurisdictions. We, we do a lot of training in our community, uh, but it's pretty standardized around the state. So some of the things that we needed to do with our, our partners, they were able to come in here and assist us very well and very competently. So we've been very fortunate, but there's been a lot. And, uh, you know, I don't want to go into the numbers and things too, because, you know, I, I don't uh, talk about tactics but uh, we, we've got a lot of support from people. It's just been uh, overwhelming positive. Our next question will be from Tony. This question is for Chief Weber. I understand you know, the legal process that has to take place, but I'm curious, how do you reinstate trust between police and the public if Officer Menzo remains on the force? given that a majority of the protesters in the streets are calling for him to be fired. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a difficult process, but keep in mind the majority of protesters are calling him to be fired. They don't have the luxury of reading the reports all the time and knowing what the facts of the cases are. You know, in the three incidents that uh, Joseph Mensa was involved in, he faced three armed people. And let's not uh, minimize the fact that uh, uh, two of the people, the first two incidents, uh, the first uh, one, the Gonzalez case, that particular person had a blood alcohol level of 0.26. The second one, uh, the Anderson case, he, had a, he was, I think, legally intoxicated, plus he was under the influence of marijuana. Does that affect their judgment? Possibly. The last case, the one from Mayfair Mall, the 17-year-old, who is an adult as far as the, the way the law treats him, 17 year old he had threatened a, another customer at the mall earlier that evening with the gun the stolen gun and if, if you check he has a pretty violent history prior to this incident so let's not keep saying that these people uh, are are innocent and you know I've, I've seen a lot over the last few months that uh the police department are murderers and uh these people should be uh made martyrs they were acting illegally and uh un it's unfortunate Joseph Mensa was the officer who can't pick and choose what calls he goes on. He was the officer that was there and responded to three armed situations. I want to add to that, please, that uh, the city government and the police department, which is part of the city government, nobody wants to see people killed. Police officers don't go out 
uh, in the morning saying, I, I'm looking for someone to kill. They're looking to protect the community. Those are unfortunate incidents. Uh, our condolences go to the families for losing their loved ones. But, uh, you know, all of the facts have to be considered. And, uh, and uh, so to rebuild community trust, uh, I think everyone needs to look at all the facts and realize that we all have to work together. It's not just the city government function. It's not just a police department function. It's the entire community working together to rebuild trust, not only between department and, and city or city and community, but we have to rebuild our trust among friends. I believe I've lost friends through this, last, this these past several days, and that's unfortunate. There are community groups, there are people I know, that my friends who are working to, to heal this community, and we're eager to work with everybody we can to heal the community as long as they're willing partners. The next question will be from Box 6. <clears throat> yeah, Chief, just in a general sense, what is the protocol within the department after a line of duty death? In other words, does an officer need to be cleared from like a, a psychologist, for example, before returning to work? Yeah, well, what, what happens is we immediately place an officer on administrative leave. <clears throat> And uh, until, because it, it's, it's treated as a homicide investigation from the district attorney, until the district attorney makes his ruling, there's nothing more that can really be done by us. Um, and, and of course, the, the statute also provides that another agency has to investigate the incident. So in this particular case, the most recent one, Milwaukee Police Department was the agency that investigated, so I had no hand in that investigation whatsoever. The officers do attend counseling, which is mandatory, and, and if they need more than that, it's up to them. I don't always, you know, it's whatever they're diagnosed with, if they have an issue that's not reported to me, that's all medical, but we rely on our psychologists and, uh, and uh, counselors to uh, clear an officer and determine whether or not they are fit to, to come back to work or if they need some other help all along the way. Then once the district attorney makes their decision, um, then we can decide where we go from there. But in this case, we're waiting for the police and fire commission decision too. Our next question will be from Hillary. You know, that independent investigator said that Joseph Mensa is unfit for duty. I know you said it's up to the police and fire commission, but what do you see moving forward for him? The police and fire commission, as I said earlier, needs to have the time and the space to do its work. It would be imprudent for uh, anybody in city government, whether that be the mayor or the police department or anybody else to, to put additional pressure on commissioners who are already feeling intense community pressure. We must let the legal process play itself out. So I hope you respect the fact that we're trying to uh, give the commission the time and the space it needs to do a thoughtful and deliberative job to make sure that everyone's rights and the community's uh, concerns are addressed. Our next question will be from Ben Jordan. So last week, the Cole family alleged that Officer Mensa was involved in a fourth shooting, but the records on that case are sealed. Chief Weber, are you aware of these allegations and is there any merit to them? This is the first I've heard of that. that some of these allegations get more ridiculous as we go on. There's no truth to that. I'd also like to point out that, the, that one of the Cole family members made a uh, uh, on Facebook made threats against me and my niece and uh, uh, said some things uh, that uh, I think uh, a reasonable person should regret saying. So uh, there's, there, there's a lot of wild talk out there and I think that needs to be taken into account. Our next question will be from Evan Casey. Yeah, 
and if it is decided to keep Officer Mensa um, serving on the force by the Police and Fire Commission, um, does the city anticipate more protests to occur at that time? And if so, um, will another curfew be enacted by the city as well? I don't believe that we're going to uh, have a full level of peace in Wauwatosa until the, the issue of Officer Mensa is resolved. People have a constitutional right to protest. We can't tell them when or where. Uh, they're, I mean, we can, they have limits as, you know, time and all that, but if they choose to protest, they choose to protest. We just ask them to stay within the bounds of the law when they do that. So we're anticipating further protests. If I could expand on that a little bit further, will people protest some more? They might. What's unclear to me always is what they're protesting about, because if you want to change a process, that's usually done through the elected uh, bodies, uh, you know, the state or local governments. People are protesting, they don't like the decisions that are made. And as the mayor said, there's a due process, the constitution allows for the due process clause. So if you're gonna protest, why don't you go and, and talk to the uh, people who can actually make something happen? In fact, we've got some of the protests is our, our own elected officials in the, in the state and in the city we've seen too and it's like they're the people that can make decisions and uh, they choose not to do that so uh, nothing nothing's going to change people can continue to protest they can protest day in day out which they've indicated they want to do it's not going to change anything it's not going to change what we do because the law still provides that we are going to keep the peace and that's what our intention is and that's what we'll do i'd like to add something to that the chief mentioned the elected officials what he's really talking about our state legislators, we've had a couple of state legislators that have been frequent visitors to my house and Mayfair Mall and City Hall and all that in these protests. We talked to those state legislators and we've said, under state law, the mayor has no say over hiring, firing, and discipline of police officers. The Common Council has no say over hiring, firing, and discipline of police officers. You're the state legislators. You want to change the law, you go ahead and do that. But meanwhile, I've taken an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution and the laws of the state of Wisconsin. Until those laws are changed, I'm going to enforce the laws that are on the books. So I throw it back to the state legislators. If you don't like the laws, those are your laws. Change them. Our next question is from Dan Malloy. Dan, go ahead. Can't hear you. Okay, how about now? All right. Okay, um, on the topic of the state legislature, uh, there was a special session in recent months that lasted only a couple minutes. Is it realistic to tell um, these lawmakers to get back to the Capitol and change the laws if the, uh, those who are in charge of the, the houses there refuse to do anything about it? Well, of course, uh, the legislature needs to do some work. They haven't been in session all year. That's, that's scandalous. But it's not realistic for legislators to tell me to do something that's contrary to the laws that are on the books. So that's their problem. If they can't get it together to have a session of the legislature, shame on them. But they shouldn't be preaching to me that I should violate the very laws that are on the books. I took an oath to enforce those laws and I will enforce those laws as uh, I understand them and as I get legal advice to do that. The laws that are in the book say I have no hiring, firing and discipline authority over police officers. That authority belongs to the police and fire commission unless and until the state legislature gets back into session and changes its mind. The next question is from Ben Jordan. Chief Weber, do you happen to have a total number of officers who were in Wauwatosa responding to these protests, not only from your department, from the assisting departments, as well as a total number of uh, the total number of uh, National Guard members in town as well? Yeah, I'll, I'll be getting that in the next couple of days because it's been a kind of a fluid uh, number of changes rapidly and from day to day. 
So uh, right now I don't have the total in front of me how many we got, but as I said earlier, it's, it's a lot of people and we've got a lot of resources. There are currently no hands raised from our attendees. Our next question is from Dan Malloy. Um, earlier today, you mentioned that the city really wanted to avoid a scene similar to Kenosha. What was so important that you guys saw from those demonstrations and protests that followed that you would not allow to happen in Wauwatosa, and how did you uh, prevent that? I'm not sure I totally understand your question, but let me say this. We had credible threats in the weeks and months ahead of this that uh, people were threatening to burn down Mayfair, for example, and burn down Tosa and other uh, threatened acts of violence. We saw what happened in Kenosha. We saw what happened in Portland and Louisville and other places. Uh, it was our determination to make sure that none of those uh, things happened in Wauwatosa. As I said, if you're talking about credible threats of, of arson, we arrested people that had Molotov cocktails in their backpacks and we found a Molotov cocktail at the base of the city hall sign. And people were attempting to light up dumpsters on North Avenue. So that's just an example of what we were taking seriously and what actually came about. The good news is we had no loss of life, uh, very few injuries at all, none serious, and uh, the property damage was minimal. We set out to keep the community safe. The community was kept safe. Life goes on in Wauwatosa today. There are currently no hands raised from attendees. Our next question is from WUWM. Yes, um, as you guys are talking about just like next steps going forward, um, are you planning to bring like anyone from the community to the table? I'm wondering who's going to be involved as you guys try to improve, you know, the, the atmosphere in Tulsa. We've already been embarked upon uh, an effort and this started before George Floyd was murdered, but the, the city government, we've uh, uh, retained the services of the Zeidler Group to engage in community dialogue sessions. We've already embarked on that. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has limited our ability to do it as uh, uh, frequently as we want, but we are going to continue by Zoom if we have to. In addition, uh, community members have reached out uh, to try to set up some meetings. Uh, I'm, uh, we're, we're trying to find times for that in our busy schedules, all of us, and I mean the community members as well as the city officials. Uh, we are hoping to have a nationally recognized mediator come in to assist us. There are all kinds of efforts that we're engaged in, and uh, the door at City Hall is always open. The phones are always working. We're always ready to listen. There are currently no hands raised from attendees. Our next question is from Ben Jordan. Chief Weber, um, what message are you sending to your officers during, their, during this time when there is a lot of outcry against their profession? Not only because of what's happened here in Wauwatosa, but what's happened across the country. Are you sending a message to your officers um, to support them at this time? Yeah, I, I think we, we uh, talk to them a lot and uh, these officers have been very professional and uh, compassionate. They're very articulate. Some of the things that uh, get said to them at protests and even, even to the officers who are uh, people of color are just outrageous uh, comments. And I wanna make certain that people understand, you know, we, we uh, allow peaceful protests. We all understand that's the First Amendment right. We've not really had peaceful protests uh, the last few months in Wauwatosa because intimidation, disruption, and scare tactics and threats are not peaceful, nor is it protected by the law. So our officers have been very patient. And just like when we had the arrests over the weekend, 
um, we gave several warnings before we would even uh, go to the next level because we gave people every opportunity to abide by the law. I'd like to add to that, please. A few months ago, I heard an interview with the president of the borough of Brooklyn in New York City. He's an African-American man, a former a New York City Police Department officer for 23 years. So he's been an elected official as well as a, a beat cop. And he said, we have problems with policing in this country. We have to recognize that. There are some bad apples. There are some people that have violated the law. Unfortunately, they stain the reputation of all the good law abiding officers as well. And I would add to that, there are elected officials who do things that are untoward and illegal and regrettably lawyers who do things and that stains the profession as well. But what the borough president said was, remember that there's a human being inside that blue uniform and he or she goes home at night to his or her children and their spouses. And they have the same challenges that we all do, whether we're garbage collectors or elected officials or lawyers or police officers. So inside this, this suit, with this tie as a human being inside the blue uniforms of the police officers, there are human beings and human beings are imperfect. Some police officers are imperfect, but most police officers I believe are, are not only are they sworn to protect the community, that is their mission. I do want to say too that our, our police officers are proud of the profession that they're involved in. They're proud of what they do and rightly so because I'm proud of them too because, you know, I've, I've done this job longer than anybody has. And, you know, you hear those things sometimes. He's too old, he should retire. Um, I've done this since uh, the 1970s. And through the years, we've always had great police officers. But the officers that we hire today are more multicultural raised, they are more compassionate, articulate, smarter, better educated than the police officers at any other time in, our, in my career. So I'm very proud of them, and, and the, uh, the future is very bright for law enforcement. We need to get over the, some of this stuff that's going on now, and people need to support not only police officers, but to support the governments, you know, um, because what's going to happen, we've seen in some of the cities, when, that's, when the police officers are not uh, performing their jobs the way they should. So I'm optimistic, and I, I think our department is a great department, so I'm very proud of them. There are currently no hands raised from attendees. Our next question is from WUWM. Yes, I just wanted to go back and make sure I heard clearly. I believe it was Chief Chief Weber. Um, were you saying that there were there haven't been any peaceful protests in Tulsa? Is that what you? No, I didn't say that at all. We've had some peaceful protests. I think we even had peaceful protests last night, as a matter of fact, up until seven o'clock, and we had no issues with that. And, and people left on their own, except a couple of people said, I'm not leaving, arrest me. We get that, we've got that a few times over the weekend. We've had peaceful protests, and as long as people follow the, the rules, and but if, if they're gonna go in neighborhoods and disrupt the neighborhoods uh, late at night and scare uh, people and children, or go threaten to burn down the mall or something like that. That's not a peaceful protest, but we've had we've had both, and uh, and I think people need to uh, make the distinction between the two. We've had uh, both kinds of protests in the same night in the same place. Let me give you an example. About three weeks ago, first of all, I want to say I've had at least twenty three protests outside my home alone. Uh, one of those nights, I had a four hour protest from six p.m. until ten p.m. outside my house. The first three hours were peaceful. There were about a dozen people marching back and forth in front of my house, chanting, not disrupting the neighborhood. It was totally acceptable. At nine o'clock, a different group showed up, started honking horns repeatedly, blocked the, the street outside my house, 70th Street, both sides of the street, impeding any traffic that wanted to go through blocked the intersection, raced up and down the, the street in front of my house, drove on my neighbor's lawns, screamed and yelled vulgarities, flashed strobe lights in my windows, and any number of other things. 
So in one night, in one four hour stretch, I saw three hours of peaceful protesting and one hour of unacceptable, unlawful behavior. So please protest if you wish, do so lawfully and peacefully. There are currently no hands raised from attendees. The next question is from WUWM. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, have you guys spoken with any um, protesters maybe that had been arrested and were talking about their experiences? Or have you spoken to any in general that have been out on the streets seeing all the activity? Have you heard anything? I, I have not spoken to any protesters. Uh, I've spoken to the police officers that are involved there, but I've been in a, in a command uh, uh, model uh, mode. so. Um, I have not, but I, I'm sure that we'll, once the reports all start coming in, we'll get all the information that we need and what they have to say. I have spoken to a few. I've received probably hundreds of emails from protesters or people who sympathize with the protesters. I've received scores of voicemail messages from people who were either involved or supportive of the protesters. And I will say, of course, I've received hundreds of emails and scores of phone calls from people who uh, support the efforts of the city and the police department to make sure that everyone remains safe during this difficult time. So uh, we were all uh, at city government on high alert. We were in a bunker basically for five days trying to figure things out, uh, but we were monitoring. Uh, I was monitoring emails and phone calls and responding as I could, but uh, I hope you can appreciate that it was difficult to respond to everyone in real time. And that's the process we are going to begin in earnest today now that we are moving forward again. We're a strong community. We're going to get through it. And as I said earlier, Wauwatosa's Wauwatosa today. Kids are going to school. Moms and dads are going to work. People are walking their dogs. <clears throat> business as usual. Like, like the mayor said, many of the uh, calls and messages I got from people were supportive. Most of them are supportive. There's going to be a few people that send messages where I, I get this and it's like, are they even in the same community because it was so uh, off, off base? Uh, but the vast majority of people that have been in contact with us have been very supportive. Our Facebook, uh, we put a lot of things out on social media. Our Facebook uh, presence, uh, I think the hits on it, it increased. 37,000% over the last few days. We have been, we've had over 400,000 people look at our Facebook and social media. So we're getting the message out there as quickly as we can because people want information and we've done that the best we can. And, and I think with the more information people have gotten, they're able to respond to that and uh, make good decisions. We literally had a room full of communicators working around the clock to push out information to the community in every way we could. And I supplemented their, their efforts by appearing on as many media uh, shows and you know, radio and TV programs as I could to make sure that everyone heard from the, from the city government. Our next question is from Ben Jordan. Why was there such a focus on protecting Mayfair um, and, and less of a focus on the small businesses throughout downtown Wauwatosa? Those were the ones that ended up, you know, getting hit with rocks and whatnot. Uh, the reason is because most of the threats came against Mayfair Mall. Uh, we would get those and we get threats against the mall a lot because it's one of the most visible assets of Wauwatosa. Where we had the, the problems with the small businesses, protesters that first night were coming down North Avenue, westbound on North Avenue, we had no issues. They weren't doing anything to any businesses at all. So uh, there was no need for us to really intervene because it was peaceful. But then all of a sudden, when they got to around 92nd Street, then they started breaking windows and, and attacking some of the local businesses and even residences too. That's when it all changed for us. And then we had to step in and start using some of the other uh, defensive uh, uh, postures and, and weapons too. So it was good. And then there was also threats maybe to go down to the village, but 
the, the time when some of the arrests were made, people were on their way down to the village, but then they were out past curfew and uh, there, there never was any other issues. We had um, police deployed throughout the city to make sure that businesses were protected. I'd like to read to you a text message I received just this morning from a small business in Wauwatosa's village retail district. He said, I can't imagine the stress and tough decisions you've had to make in your first six months in office. I wanted to let you know, I am open for business today. And that is a no small part to those decisions you have had to make. Keep doing the best you can. That is all we should ask. Thanks for your public service. That's what I'm hearing from the business community. There are currently no hands raised from attendees. Next question is from Jim. Jim, if you could unmute. Hi, Mayor. Uh, you made a comment that you wanted to leave the Police and Fire Commission <clears throat> to make the decision regarding the future of Officer Mensa. Um, however, uh, Alderperson Heather Kuhl has been making direct contact with members of the Police Fire Commission and essentially lobbying for his termination. I'd like comment from you on that. Do you think her behavior is appropriate? Alderwoman Cool was elected by the residents of the 5th Aldermanic District. She represents that district independently. I have no control over her or the other 15 members of the Common Council, nor do they have any control over what I say and do. We are all independently elected officials. If she chooses to make statements, uh, that's something she'll have to be accountable for to her constituents. Uh, I'm gonna leave it at that. There are currently no hands raised from attendees. Next question is from WUWM. Hi, yes, I'm, I'm sorry if I missed this earlier in the conversation. Um, I know you guys said there is no curfew right now. Um, but are the, is the National Guard still around and how, um, how long might they be if they are? It's one of those tactical questions that I really don't want to get into. Let's just uh, say this is that if we need to have more assets brought into the city, no matter what it's for, we, we have access to that. Um, but no, I don't want to go into any more information about that, but you, you can understand why. There are currently no hands raised from attendees. So while we're waiting, uh, if you have any more questions, I do want to give you my perspective on one thing, but I know that uh, there's been a lot of requests from the media for us to speak to you uh, prior to, to now. And as the mayor said, we've been busy doing a lot of things and it's been a, a lot of uh, uh, complex operations. So I apologize that I haven't been available to you to the degree that you would like, because usually we are pretty, pretty accessible to the media, but I'm hoping that our public information stuff and the, the information we put out to you has been helpful. And certainly, um, you know, I, I appreciate the, the questions that you have for me. And, and as you know, anytime, if you have anything, just let us know, and we'll try to answer them for you. So thank you. There are no hands raised from attendees at this time. Next question is from Jim. Hi, Mayor. Uh, regarding the uh, independent investigation that was done by Biskupic, um, we'd like to know a little bit more about the process. Why was Biskupic selected and were there any other contenders and who made the final decision to select him? Well that's something that the Police and Fire Commission did. I wasn't part of that process. 
nor was any other part of the city government involved. They determined, as I understand it, they determined that they needed the assistance of an independent investigator to supplement the investigations that had already been done by the Milwaukee Police Department, by the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, and the District Attorney's Office in, in the three cases. Um, so uh, that was completely a decision of the Police and Fire Commission. There are currently no hands raised from attendees. You have us for another 28 minutes, so we're, we're ready to, to answer anything you have. The next question is from Ben Jordan. Chief Weber, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this and heard this a lot, but a lot of these protesters are calling from, for your resignation um, due to this outcry over Officer Mensa. What is your response to those who are calling for you to leave the job? Yeah, they, they really haven't given me a, a reason that I should leave other than they don't like me. And it wouldn't matter if I was the chief or somebody else was the chief. It's just who was ever in that position. So, um, the only thing I can say to that is, you know, I, I don't appeal to everybody. I understand that. What I've tried to do my whole career is to do the right thing. That's what we do in our police department. Uh, everybody knows we do the right things at the right time in the right re for the right reasons and in the right way. That's the four ideals that we have here. That's what I've tried to do. And I, I believe we have a professional ethical group. And when the time comes and it's time for me to leave, then I'll make that decision. But, uh, you know, so... Uh, I don't really have much more to say than that. It's, uh, people don't like me. I, I get that. I don't think everybody likes me in the police department sometimes too, but that's just the, the way this human nature is. There are currently no hands raised from attendees. Next question is from Ben Jordan. How do you hope that the city moves on from this incident and get, gets back to a normal life? Do you see that happening within the next few months? I mean, it's been, you know, eight months of, of uh, times. It, what is your hope for the city to get back to normal? And can that happen with Officer Mensa on the force? Well, first of all, Wauwatosa is a strong community. It always has been. We're going to make sure it stays that way. You know, America is traumatized. We've been suffering through a pandemic. People are a little crazy about that. I'm a little crazy. We're all a little crazy about having to be shut in and worrying about our health and the health of our loved ones. And on top of that, we have racial justice and equity concerns. We happen to have a police officer in our community who's been the focus of a lot of attention. Uh, we, are, we are suffering collective trauma, but this strong community will find a way to get through it. We are continuing, as we said earlier, to build on our equity initiatives that were ongoing long before any of this came up. We are uh, committed as a, as a city government to achieving uh, success in that field. And, and you know, one of the things was I didn't mention earlier as part of our budget process, every department director was told to make sure that he or she had as part of the budget process equity initiatives uh, that we could achieve through, through whatever uh, budgeting uh, we could do. So it's not just the police department, it's all of the city. And again, we're gonna work with community groups to make sure that we, we get through this. Uh, I'm not gonna pretend that it's easy. We've been traumatized, we've all been traumatized by this. It's a difficult thing. The community is divided in opinion, but we're strong in every other way. Just to follow up on that too, you know, Joseph Mensa was called to do things that most police officers do not have to do in their career. 
However, this decision weighs in the end, and, and we'll see how that goes. He needs uh, support from our community because he responded when he, he needed to respond. So he's done his job, and it's, it's been very difficult not only for the community, but also for him personally and for the members of the department. But that's what police officers are called upon to do. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, when I'm just uh, using Joe Mensa as an example, but I think it's time that our citizens everywhere need to thank police officers and public officials and public safety for the service that they do provide because uh, we've seen what's happening around the country where they're not doing the things that they need to do. So uh, I think going forward, as the mayor said, Wauwatosa is a strong community. And I think it's always been very re uh, resilient to some of the things that have gone on. When I first came here 30 years ago, there were some scandals in the police department. We worked through those. And the community has always supported us, no matter what's uh, what's going on, uh, good, bad, or otherwise, because they know that our hearts are always in the right place, and we try to do the, what's best for everyone. There are currently no hands raised from attendees. Next question is from Jim. Chief, I'd like to know, um, are you in regular contact with Officer Mensa? How is he holding up through all this? And in general, how is the morale of your department through this right now? Yeah, um, I, I don't have regular contact with him. I do on occasion, but we do have officers that do uh, speak to him regularly that we assigned even, and, and then his friends on the department. Uh, I think it's been very difficult and stressful for him, as you uh, well can imagine. But I think, and, and the morale of the department, you know, some of the things that's been really tough, the decisions when he was placed on the suspension, uh, that was very uh, hard on the department. Um, you know, now when you see a decision uh, like from the independent investigator that he should be removed because of something he might do in the future, if that happens, then every police officer, no matter where they work, are, are never going to be safe because any police officer can get into problems uh, in the future. So we'll get through that too. I think it's, uh, you know, the, the fact that I had so many de dedicated police officers that were here in Wauwatosa over the weekend is a testament to still that everybody focuses on the mission at hand. No matter what their personal feelings are, this is what they do. And uh, I think uh, going forward, we'll build on that. And uh, I think, it, by and large, our community has been supportive of us. Unfortunately, a lot of people are afraid to say that they're supportive because then they become a target. That's, that's what's going on in our country. If you say you support a, a certain candidate for a president or versus somebody else or anything, you become a target. If you dis disagree with a particular group, well, then it's because you're, you're a racist or you have other problems, you're old like me or something. There's, there's always, uh, we don't have that, uh, there's such a polarization that we never used to have and there's just, we don't tolerate other people's opinions. And we see that at, at every level right now and that's what's really hard going forward. And that's gonna be the challenge for all of us as US citizens. There are currently no hands raised from attendees. The next question is from Jim. Uh, this is to the mayor. Mayor, um, the, uh, the chairman of the ad hoc um, committee, um, John Larry, um, is on, was on body cam <laughs> video making threats to a police lieutenant of some other egregious comments, both on social media um, what is your feeling about him remaining on that ad hoc committee? Well, first of all, the ad hoc committee was created by the Government Affairs Committee of the Common Council. I had no say in that. Uh, second, because I had no say in it, I have no power to, to uh, remove anybody from that committee. That's a decision that has to be made by the Common Council. 
I will say that Mr. Larry has made a number of intemperate comments which caused me to question his judgment, such as calling me a member of the Proud Boys on social media recently, which is offensive. And I would hope that if he wants to continue to be what he styles as a community leader, that he tempers his comments and his behavior so that he can be a constructive <clears throat> member of whatever body that he's part of. We want to work with everybody in Wauwatosa to make sure that we continue to uh, achieve uh, racial equity and justice and make sure that our community remains strong and welcoming. My job every day, my hope, my mission is to make my hometown a more welcoming community to everyone. I just have to chime in there too, because the, my, my position is, I'm not as eloquent as the mayor, but I'm absolutely outraged that somebody like that, uh, with, with uh, that background and the, the conduct that he's uh, engaged in, would be allowed to be uh, on a committee that serves the city that way. It's an embarrassment, and I hope something changes in the near future. But as the mayor said, that's not our decision either. But I can't, uh, I can't participate with a group where you have people who are threatening police officers, and we, we say that's okay. That's one of the things that's going to keep this community from moving forward when we allow that kind of thing to continue on. There are currently no hands raised from attendees. The next question is from Jim. Uh, this is to the mayor. Mayor, there's been some Milwaukee area elected officials as well as some community leaders that are now calling curfews, um, describing them as being racist. Um, I'd like your opinion on that. Uh, do you believe that curfews are racist? The short answer is absolutely not. The longer answer is this. The curfew is not put in place to suppress protests. By the way, most of the protesters were white, as, as far as I could tell. Uh, so if it's racist, it's racist against white people and black people, which doesn't, by definition, make much sense. The curfew was put in place because we wanted to protect the safety of all of the people in Wauwatosa, residents and non-residents, workers and non-workers, people who are in Wauwatosa. Our, our laser focus was to make sure that no one got hurt. I will add this. Wauwatosa is my hometown. I've spent my entire life, my entire life, in civic life and in professional life, working for racial justice and equity. I was an attorney for 24 years for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, representing people of color, disabled people, women, uh, people discriminated against based on their religion, whatever. That is the mission of my life. I sponsored the resolution to make the home of our first black family in Wauwatosa a city landmark, which was passed unanimously last year. Everything I've done has been through a racial justice an equity lens, everything in my life. As mayor, my primary job is to make sure that the people who are in Wauwatosa, whether they are residents or not, are kept safe. The curfew was solely for that purpose. There are currently no hands raised from attendees. Does this mean we've answered all the questions now? We have a question from Jim.
Jim, can you go? Uh, Mayor, I just want to do one quick follow-up just to confirm I understand you correctly. Um, it was up to the Police and Fire Commission um, who hired um, Ms. Kupik. I just want to make sure, are you aware of anyone else outside of the Police and Fire Commission that was involved in the vetting of him? I am not personally aware of any such thing. Whether it was true or not, I'm not sure. I am not personally aware of that. There are currently no hands raised. It is 1147. Please raise your hand if you wish to ask a question at this time. We have a question from WUWM. Hi, yes. Um, just since we've been talking, um, just a little bit about how protesters uh, were saying they were um, treated over the weekend. Um, are either of you concerned that their due process had been violated? I mean, maybe it doesn't make sense if you guys were saying there had been no truth, but um, if you guys are willing to answer. Well, let me say this, that uh, we took great pains to make sure that uh, all of the actions that were undertaken over the last several days were done lawfully, as is always the case in Wauwatosa. We always try to uh, stay within the bounds of the law. If people got ticketed, if they got arrested, if they were charged with anything, they will have the opportunity to go before the municipal court or the circuit court and state their reasons why they should be, uh, they, the charges should be dropped. That's the due process that we have in America and that's the due process that everyone gets if they are charged with anything. So we are confident that the courts will do their job and that uh, uh, justice will continue to be served. And along those lines, if I, I just could elaborate, you know, the one, of the, one of the things that we constantly hear from people is we want justice. We want justice. And what people need to realize, justice is what we have is, like in the, in the case with the, uh, the uh, shooting, justice means that the district attorney or a grand jury or whoever looks at the facts of the case and makes a determination based on the facts and what the law is, whether or not a prosecution is going to occur or not. That's what justice is. If the district attorney makes the decision that he's not going to charge an officer, justice has been served. And you know, that's, that's what the process is all about unless you're gonna change the laws. So uh, when people continue to say, we want justice, I don't know if justice is what they're asking for anymore uh, because it's not gonna change. Sometimes I, I think that maybe revenge is or something or punishment is in their mind, but that's really beyond what this whole uh, this whole system is all about the criminal justice system. It's called justice for reason. Justice means having your, your uh, case looked at. I want to add this, please. A lot of people have said to me, not just over the last several days, but over the past several months, why are these people getting tickets? Can't you fix the tickets? Can't you undo the tickets? Well, first of all, under state law, I have no authority to undo tickets. That's a matter for the court. But beyond that, my response is, what we've said to you repeatedly is, if you protest peacefully and lawfully, you will not be disturbed. You have a constitutional right to protest if you do so peacefully and lawfully. If while protesting, you violate a law, you've crossed the line. You are subject to arrest, you're subject to a ticketing. People have said to me, well, you know, why don't you just not enforce some of those laws? And my question back to them is, I took an oath to enforce the laws, as did the police department. Which laws would you have me enforce? Which laws would you decide that I shouldn't enforce? Isn't that a matter for the state legislature? They decided which laws are on the books. You may disagree with those laws, but you need to talk to your elected officials about whether those laws are on the books. And people have said, and I'm gonna say this finally, people have said, well, you shouldn't give tickets for curfew violations. Well, I understand that. I understand the profound 
community disagreement over the imposition of the curfew, which I said was done solely for the purpose of safety and well-being. But that order was a lawful order under state law. While it was in effect, it was a law. And if people chose to break the law, they suffer the consequences. The curfew is no longer in force. They don't have to worry about that anymore. But we don't have, we have elected officials, elected bodies to determine which laws are in force and which laws should be obeyed. And we, we can't just say, just because someone has screamed louder than someone else that that law won't be enforced. That's not how our system works. It is 11.52. We currently have no hands raised. We have time for one more question. Question from WUWM. Yes, um, I'd be interested in um, both of you answering this question. Um, do you believe there is a, an issue with race in the city of Wauwatosa? There's an issue of race in, throughout America. We've had over 400 years of racial problems, starting with the imposition of slavery back in 1619. Human beings have problems with differences. Wauwatosa is not immune from any of that. But what I can tell you is this, we are working to overcome the issues of racism every day in Wauwatosa. As I said earlier, that has been my life mission and I am not gonna give up on that. The chief, the city government, we're all, all committed to that mission. One of the things that, uh, from my perspective, I don't think the police officers in our department uh, have issues of uh, racism. We've, we have a, we're a pretty uh, uh, diversified uh, department. We, we hire a lot of different people, different races and ethnicities. Um, we're used to dealing with people of, of color and, and minorities all the time. So um, unfortunately, people sometimes uh, perceive uh, about their treatment um, we're, as the mayor said, we're working to make sure that doesn't happen and, and we'll continue to do that. As long as there's people out in the communities though around our country that feel that they've been treated uh, inappropriately or unjustly, those are issues that are going to have to be addressed and we'll continue to work to do that So, because we want uh, our, our, community, our community to always be a, a welcoming place like it's always been perceived uh, in recent history. Thank you all for attending. This now concludes our press conference. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. I appreciate it very yes, much. Thank you.